There are very few investors and economic commentators as well known or as globally recognized as Mark Faber. He's best known for calling the 1987 crash, the dot-com bubble, and the 2008 financial meltdown. His nickname is Dr. Doom, and he has just bought Bitcoin for the first time ever. In this interview, you'll get to hear straight from Dr. Faber what's on his mind at the moment. Just when the stock market has enjoyed its best first quarter since 1955, and as government continues to claim record low unemployment, virtually no official inflation, and businesses can't hire fast enough. At least that's what the lying politicians are claiming, but we all know that this magical boom is sustained by debt, which soon comes due. For the gloom, doom, and boom author, Mark Faber exclusive report that goes along perfectly with this interview, go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Mark, that's M-A-R-C. On top of listening to the actual interview, I urge you to download the PDF as it goes hand in hand with Faber's recorded interview. It's critical reading if you want to avoid the fate of tens of millions of Americans who will not be ready when the moment of truth comes. It's PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Mark. Enjoy this important interview. Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. So far this year, we have released some bombshell interviews. It's always essential to keep yourself educated on the real news. We bring you the insiders to keep you up to date on the real news that is shaping the future for all of us. Be sure to check out our interviews and our free reports. A few of our latest shows are Robert David Steele with his report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Robert. Bob Moriarty at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Bob. Charles Hugh Smith at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Smith. And our interview with President Reagan advisor, David Stockman. His report can be found at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash David. Today, we are honored to be welcoming back to the show Dr. Mark Faber. Dr. Faber is the publisher of Gloom, Boom, Doom Report and the director of the Mark Faber LTD, which acts as an investment advisor and fund manager. Mark is famous for his uncanny predictions and his investment strategies. Our our free extensive report covering him can be found at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Faber, and it is truly a must-read mark. Welcome back to the show. How are you today? Thank you very much. I'm fine. Oh, we are thrilled to have you here. It is always a privilege. We want Thank to start you. off with something that we are seeing happen for the very first time. We're watching many top investors throughout the world openly talking about the perils of government deficits. Larry Fink, founder of BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, called the modern monetary theory as stated as being government's deficits can continue indefinitely junk. Ray Dalio has been openly critical of the Fed and has said that he is actually fearful of the lack of tools and options that remain to combat this problem. Mark, talk to us about what's happening throughout the world and what's happening in the minds of these very large investors. Well, first of all, uh, as you know, once in a while, all theories come out under a new uh, name like money printing became a quantitative easing and so it was acceptable because people thought well it's not exactly money printing but in fact it is money printing it's just increasing the quantity of money uh, through uh, central banks asset purchases and this MMT modern uh, monetary theory is actually not that modern. It was developed by two economists at the beginning of the 20th century. One was a German economy, George Friedrich Knapp, and the other Alfred Mitchell Innes, a British diplomat and economist and advisor to various governments around the world which argued that actually money was uh, or money was not based on individual people transacting but actually was a state institution that money arose because the state called money money 
And so because of that, they called it essentially uh, chartalism. And out of that came this modern monetary theory, which basically argues that the government uh, being able to tax the system, in other words, the government has the power to impose taxation on you and me and on corporations and everybody, that because of that, the government could always pay its debts and therefore they could issue essentially money uh, for a very long time without having uh, any negative consequences. Well, this is to some extent not a false assumption. So I wouldn't call the modern monetary theory garbage, as Larry Fink called it. But uh, I think the danger, as with uh, quantitative easing, is that politicians will use it indefinitely and that once implemented, it's very difficult to abandon these uh, programs. In other words, we can see it nowadays with the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and even the Fed in the US. <laughs> the Fed in the US did the right thing. They wanted to start to reduce their balance sheet, which they've done to some extent. They've reduced it by, say, about 10% from the peak. But now, because they're doing that and the others are not doing it, the dollar is strong and uh, the interest rates in the US are much higher than they are in Europe. Just consider, uh, 10 years US treasuries have now a higher yield than 10 years Portuguese, Spanish, and Italian bonds, not to mention German bonds, Swiss bonds, Dutch bonds, and so forth. But these are the three weakest credits in Europe, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. And US treasuries have a higher yield than these bonds. So the market, in my opinion, is kind of mispricing uh, the bond market internationally, partly because the U.S. has started to increase interest rates, as we know. We went from zero to close to two and a half percent on the Fed fund rate, whereas the ECB is keeping rates close to zero. So I, I think that now the problem is uh, the quantitative, quantitative easing has been successful in lifting asset prices, home prices, uh, stock prices, bond prices, art prices, collectible prices, and so forth. But it's failed to lift the standards of living of ordinary people meaningfully. They've recovered somewhat, but not very meaningfully. Uh, and there are statistics that young people at the age of 35, the so-called millennials, they have less money than I had when I was 35, and they earn less than I earned when I was 35 in real terms, inflation adjusted. So, I mean, something is not quite wrong, uh, not quite right. And here, uh, the MMT people come in, and say, well, the problem is quantitative easing only went to some people, namely the ones that benefited from rising asset prices, but it didn't go to people that didn't have any assets. And in the US, 50% of Americans don't pay any federal income tax because they're below the, the level that would require them to pay federal income tax. So they have basically no money, do you understand? So they have no assets, so they didn't benefit. And now the MMT comes in and is uh, the proponents of MMT, this modern monetary theory, are largely people on the left side and more like socialist leaning people 
who say, well, we have to help the ordinary people in the US and elsewhere. And to do that, we have to actually spend money directly, not indirectly through quantitative easing. So we spend money directly by increasing budgets for health care and education and so forth and so on. And in theory, a good socialist could one day say, well, uh, what we need to do is to forgive all student debts. We just put them on the balance sheet of the government. We just pay them off and that's it. Hmm. So you understand the danger and I've studied this modern monetary theory somewhat. I'm not an expert because it leaves many things open. But very clearly, the economists that pr propose it were leaning towards a, a more socialist agenda. And actually, John Maynard Keynes, in his work on money, in his treatise on money, in the first few pages, he discussed the theory and he brought up the theories of the two economists I just mentioned, uh, Knapp and Mitchell Innes. So it had some validity already then and uh, Keynes considered it in his work, in his theories. But the problem is as follows. About 15 years ago, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe wanted to build a bridge. So his finance minister said, well, we don't have the money to build it. So Mugabe said, then just print it. You, you understand? Yeah. At extremis, it goes very far. You don't have the money. You just print it. And Larry Summers, with whom I usually don't agree, but he said rightly that under some conditions of this monetary theory, this modern monetary theory, MMT, the currency would collapse and that that would then lead to very high inflation rates. And that is precisely what happened in Latin America in the 1980s and in Zimbabwe and in many other countries, including more recently Turkey. And so the best is actually, in my view, and nobody will agree with me, but the best is actually to have a balanced budget. <laughs> You know, yes, what? you will have business cycles. <laughs> you will have business cycles, but you avoid a lot of problems. And I just wanted to point out that recently we had weakness in the bond market in the U.S. We then rallied a little bit, but in the last few days, the bond market hasn't been acting very well. And I think the bond market in the U.S. is beginning to smell that the combination of maybe not f further QT, quantitative tightening, as opposed to QE, but going back to QE sometimes in future, to finance the indefinite deficits that we will have in the U.S. I don't see how in the U.S., they could balance the budget anymore. I just don't see how they could do it. The budget deficit is so large that it will stay large. The only question is, will it get much larger or can they contain it somewhat at this level? Wow. So there's, we're too and far the bond gone. Market, in my view, the bond market will react one day and instead of creating a lot of inflation, as they wish to do, or instead of creating a better economic environment for the typical household in the U.S., that this MMT 
will actually do the opposite in terms of increasing interest rates, which will be bad for all the debts that individuals hold. And the household debt in the US is very high. So, I mean, uh, I know that my theory of a balanced budget <laughs> is outdated. <laughs> <That> but, <is. laughs> uh, I, I would say in the long run, a lot of countries would avoid it far bigger problems if right from the start they had balanced the budget by the constitution. Yes. Now, Dr. Faber, you brought up socialism within the United States and we're seeing it start to build. Do you think this is a serious threat to capitalism within the U.S. or do you think it's all just rhetoric? Uh, well, I think that socialism is just about the opposite of capitalism. Yes. So if you want to have a capitalism, you should avoid socialism. And if you're a socialist and you like a socialist regime, mm -hmm. uh, then you should essentially ban capitalistic ideas and free market economies. The socialist uh, view arises uh, from a group of people who think that it would be better to plan economic activity by some geniuses, which usually are themselves, the people that propose uh, socialism, they think they are qualified to tell other people what to do. Right. And so uh, it's kind of an elitarian philosophy. You have the plan. The plan is not made by everybody. The plan is made by some higher authority, like, for instance, Alexandria <laughs> Ocasio Cortez, the height of you know, who are expert <laughs> economists who have a, a good education and know how the system works and so forth. Maybe they would actually be better than what we have now, but I'm, I kind of have some reluctance to believe that. <laughs> And I want to say this because uh, I have a, a certain age. The first time I went into a communist country was in the mid-1950s. I was at the time maybe 11, 12 years old. And my mother took us to Yugoslavia because we didn't have a lot of money. And Yugoslavia, Spain, Italy were countries that were... Uh, that had a low price level, especially in Yugoslavia, so you could stay at a nice hotel on the beach or in Dubrovnik for relatively little money and food was inexpensive and so forth. But I mean, it, it surprised me how poor the country was at that time, even as an 11 year old. And then after I finished my studies, I went to Prague in 1968. I tendered my uh, doctoral thesis by, for my PhD, and so I decided to go for 10 days to Prague. And this was the Prague or spring at the time. And I arrived, I think it was August 20th or August 21. And the very evening I had arrived and checked into a pension, I mean a small hotel, like a bed and breakfast, the Russians walked in with their tanks. And I noticed this because I had gone to a nightclub and at two o'clock in the morning, as I was uh, driving home, I noticed that a lot of people were on the street and there was kind of agitation and I stopped some people and said, what's going on? He said, the Russians, the Russians are coming. So I said, where? <laughs> At the airport. <laughs> so I drove towards the airport and halfway towards the airport, a tank came towards my car. <laughs> so oh. I thought I better turn around 
and went back into the city. But as it turned out, my, the place I was living at was on the fifth floor of a building that was just opposite the broadcast building. So the Russians right away took the broadcasting building so they could broadcast their own propaganda. And so my building was surrounded by tanks. The next day I had to drive somewhere uh, and I had to ask the Russians to move the tanks so I could drive out. But what I wanted to say is at that time, I saw how poor Czechoslovakia was. It wasn't yet split between Slovakia and uh, the Czech Republic. It was Czechoslovakia. It was very poor. And then later in 1978, I went to China. Again, extremely poor. And in 1980-81, I went to Russia. I mean, in Russia, I went to see a market and people were lining up to buy rotten tomatoes and rotten apples, lining up. And all I can say is the capitalistic system and the free market embodied lots of injustices, a lot of them, and they're far from perfect. But I can tell you, any time in my life, I would take the freedom that essentially free markets bring along with them and avoid the chains that you have to endure under a socialist regime. The socialist regime is anti-freedom. It tells people how many umbrellas they need to produce, even if there is no rain. They tell people how, what kind of clothes they have to wear even if they don't like those, co those colors. This is the state-planned economy. It's a complete disaster. And I can cite so many examples of hospitals, of schools, when they're privately run, they're reasonably well run, not perfectly well run, especially not when the government intervenes and tells them how many administrators they need and so forth and regulates the industry. But privately run businesses function normally much better than any government run business. And I have friends who made statistics, if you invested in state owned enterprises that have shares outstanding, you know, say banks, occasionally the major shareholder is the government or oil companies frequently in some countries, the government is the main shareholder. Where the government is usually the main shareholder, the shares have performed more poorly than in entirely free enterprises. In other words, privately owned companies. This is a fact. It is not my invention. Right. It's so frightening to see the rise of this within our country because just a couple decades ago you'd never have something like this within our political leaders. Yes, but I tell you, this was one of my fears about QE, the quantitative easing. Uh, I wrote actually already in 2001, 2002, that uh, easy monetary policies would increase wealth inequality. And especially quantitative easing when the central banks buys assets. These assets are held by insurance companies, banks and wealthy people. And so they get uh, money and they buy new assets and so you get an asset inflation. And during asset inflationary times, like in the 1920s and uh, in the last 20 years, wealth and income inequality increases dramatically. And then rightly, uh, Miss Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who was a waitress, she says something is not right in the system. That I agree with her. I agree with that thought. 
I disagree with the medicine she wants to introduce to improve the system. I think there would be other ways to do it. But you understand, whichever way you would address today's economic issues, I think uh, only a serious tightening of belts would help. And that would involve essentially a recession and everybody to make a sacrifice. Other than that, it's just taking money from one pocket into the other. <laughs> exactly. And not much will improve. I think in general, I would say capitalism uh, brings some prosperity to some and uh, less prosperity to others. And the socialism, just about everybody is poorer, except you probably read Animal Farm by George Orwell, except the pigs at the very top, they do well. And this is a must read book because it concerns today's world fairly well. Yeah. At the top, you have the pigs, they live in Washington and they are in government and they are a successful crony businessman and they all say well we should uh, we would agree that uh, wealthy people should be taxed more because they all have made their money already and they hardly pay any tax anyway <laughs> so they were happy if others would pay tax the wealthy but not themselves and so forth so I agree, you know, with Alexandria Cortes, uh, uh, Ocasio Cortes, that of course uh, the system is rigged. That is correct. Bernie Sanders says the same. And Bernie Sanders, to his credit, he questioned in the Senate uh, Alan Greenspan in 2004. There's an interview about that, and he brought up about this wealth inequality and so forth. Mm. So to his credit, he said it very early on, before it was as extreme as it is today. <coughs> yes. You know, it's... But anyway, <clears throat> you know, here we are. <laughs> and as an investor, it's nice to think about all these uh, issues and to read books and... Uh, follow what academics have to say, whereby academics also have their agenda and so forth. But the reality is, as an investor, we have to think how to invest in a money printing environment and how to invest in a fiscal expansionary period, because MMT is actually nothing else then creating gigantic budget deficits. It's a turbocharged Keynesian theory. <laughs> turbocharged Keynesian. Interesting. Keynesian, uh, Keynes thought that in good times you should have a surplus and bad times a deficit. So you would smoothen out the business cycle somewhat. But the MMT says essentially no need to have a surplus we can continue these deficits forever you know you brought up investing and you are world renowned for being highly skilled at predicting where to go when and why so focusing that, that, i'm not this, sure <laughs> we want to get your perspective right now on what's happening what is cheap and undervalued what's the contrarian position. What's what's your personal strategy, Dr. Farber? Tell us what you're doing so we can we can know. <laughs> well, it, it, to tell you the truth, my view is that what is relatively cheap is labor. You know, wages are low compared to asset prices. When I started to work in 1970 with uh, 20 hours of work, I could buy a Dow Jones. Now, someone has to work 150 hours to buy one Dow Jones. So, in other words, 
we've gone from high wages in the 60s and 70s and low asset prices to low wages and very high asset prices. So if you ask me what should I buy, what is cheap, there's nothing that is incredibly cheap. You can only argue something is relatively cheap compared to something else. But there are not many things that are very cheap. I'd say commodity prices, the price of coffee, sugar, wheat, uh, and so forth, that is relatively low, it's relatively cheap. I looked at the chart of rice. Rice is very low at the present time. Uh, relative to everything else, but also in absolute terms. So that is a sector which is low, but I discourage investors to buy commodity futures because of the rollover cost is very high. So unless agricultural commodities go up by 30% in a year, they're going to lose money. Better is to buy plantation companies or agricultural plays like say bungi or fertilizer companies and so forth that is the better play play than rolling over your commodity futures or if someone is very adventurous he can buy a coffee plantation himself but if he doesn't have much experience i uh, advise him against to do that <laughs> I mean, I would not be very suitable to run a farm for physical reasons. I mean, it's very tough work. Likewise, what is, <laughs> what, Otherwise, what is relatively cheap are some stocks in the U.S. The market is as high as it is largely because of uh, fang and fang-related stocks. But say... Consumer staples are not terribly expensive. Real estate investment trusts are not terribly expensive. And I'd like to emphasize that the real estate market in the US is like the stock market. Some markets are very expensive. Denver, Atlanta, uh, Dallas, Newport Beach, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle. Boston, New York, these are the expensive markets. But if you go to the countryside, you can buy homes at low cost. But of course you're in the countryside and there may not be a lot of uh, employment opportunities unless you're a software visit. Then it doesn't uh, matter where you live. You could be living in the middle of nowhere and essentially doing your business from the middle of nowhere. So real estate in some cases is reasonably low. What is also low is relative to financial assets are precious metals, silver, gold, platinum. But they're not cheap, cheap, cheap as they were in 1999, but they're relatively low. You know, Dr. And Fox. I would recommend people to own some precious metals. Mm -hmm. And then I had a discussion recently uh, with uh, a gentleman called Vences uh, Casares. And we talked a long time about bitcoins. And he says rightly, look, Mark, if you have assets of 100, invest one or two in bitcoins. He said one. I said maybe two. Because he says it can go to zero. So only invest what you can lose. He's honest because he is involved in the bitcoin business. But he's not a promoter the way other promoters are who say you must buy and this and that. But I'd say I think that bitcoins having now declined from 19,000 to a little under 4,000. I think that uh, as an investor, it makes sense to take a small position. As he says, it can go to zero, 
But if it becomes the standard, and we may move in future into a new currency arrangement, where if you want to send me some money for my birthday, <laughs> you don't need to go to the New York banks. You can put, click on your computer and the money comes into my wallet directly. Yep. You understand? Maybe your children and grandchildren will say one day, were you crazy to call a bank and make a remittance and you have to <laughs> sign this and all that? And they, in China, FinTech is very well developed. There are restaurants and shops where you can only pay with your mobile phone. You put your mobile phone against the screen. I'm not very good at these things. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> I'm better at drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, but this is going to be the next generation. And we have to, you know, a reader called me once, I'm old fashioned, and that I should endorse Bitcoin and so forth. But at that time, it was already very high. So I said to him, yes, I understand your arguments, but I think it will go down. And it went down, and now I think I take a little, a small position, and uh, what I can afford to lose without crying, and maybe it works out and it becomes an important position. Excellent. Ex everyone, I think, should be have a little bit in there. Because if it does go crazy... It yes, I mean, it, 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 it may go crazy and, you know, to, to, uh, it, as I said, it can go to zero. <laughs> True. But uh, I'm not a wild fan of Bitcoins. But I believe in the blockchain technology. Mm. And I believe, you know, Amazon destroyed the retail shops, the traditional retailers. Sears and J.C. Penney, they were blue chip stocks in the 1960s and 70s. You had to own them in every portfolio. And they were destroyed by Amazon, uh, aside from bad management. And, you know, rip off by uh, private uh, deal investors. But uh, I think that uh, the banking sector could be quite vulnerable to new technologies. Indeed. You know that you don't need to keep your portfolio in a bank or in a broker. Uh, you have it electronically somewhere in the world and so forth. So I think uh, there will be new technologies that are very disruptive. Almost have to be, wouldn't you say, Mark? Yeah, I. I mean, I'm not a future, <laughs> future <laughs> Lord, but I think yeah. I mean, my grandmother, she saw the first trains in the world. She saw the first running water. She first saw the first cars, airplanes, and so forth. She died in the mid 1990s when the internet was just coming up. She wasn't aware of it yet. But, I mean, she's seen so many things she never expected. And uh, I think, uh, you know, young people will live a life like we lived. I saw the first Boeing 747. I mean, this was an uh, incredible invention. I saw the first containers. Global trade would be nowhere uh, if not McLean, he was an American, hadn't invented the container. And the container is a relatively simple thing to yeah. think about. <laughs> container. You know, if you, before, you had to unload several times the goods. And now you can put them in a container and the lorry or the truck will get the container from your factory or from your house, bring it to the port or to the railroad put it on a ship, send it to China, they deliver it in front of your house. <laughs> it's a simple idea, the shipping containers. You know, it's so simple, but yes. it's, it's truly industry changing. That's interesting. The best would be to have a small apartment in the container as well. So you travel <laughs> exactly. with your furniture. You live in your pot. <laughs>
<laughs> now, Mark, you mentioned... You just put your husband in another container. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you stay over. I've got the big one. No. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, um, I want to shift back to precious metals just for a moment because you went into them a bit um, when we were talking about contrarian positions and undervalued things. Gold right now is trading at 84 to 1 to silver. What do you make of that very wide ratio? Well, I think silver and platinum are very inexpensive compared to gold. You know, like I said before, yes. the agricultural commodities are very cheap compared to gold. Yes. Yeah. But then you ask yourself, uh, you know, you always have to ask yourself, why is the market pricing something as it is? As an example, in Switzerland, we have negative interest rates on the 10 years uh, government bond. So, in other words, if you buy a 10 years government bond, you will lose, say, 1.5% over 10 years' time. Now, you will think, well, the people that buy this bond, they are crazy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, I intuitively, I agree with you. But then, you you know, you think, well, under what condition would I buy a 10 years bond that has a negative interest whereby over 10 years I lose, say, one, one and a half percent? So I asked myself, under what conditions? And I said to myself, if I believe mm. that the price of my house the price of my stock portfolio, the price of my art collection, the price of my precious metals, that they all drop by 30%. Right, so they may be And I something. can get an investment where I lose only one and a half percent, then it's a good deal. You understand? So we always have to look at how do other people think about something? And I think to get silver and platinum really moving, you need a bull market in precious metals. I think it will happen, but uh, we don't know exactly when. And maybe the bull market will not be quite as strong as some of the super bulls believe. I say this as a large holder of gold, and as a believer in gold, you understand? I just want to bring in some objectivity. Not that people say, well, he's now bearish about gold, or he's like always very bullish about gold. I'm just saying I hold gold and I believe in gold. Whereby there are some disadvantages with gold, say. You sit in America, and your gold is with you in America, but so for some reason you have to flee an America, uh, flee America and go to say I don't know Turkey or Zimbabwe <laughs> or hey. Argentina, wherever that may be. With gold in your pocket, you may not be able to cross the borders. They may take it away, or they may the socialists may take it away from you even before you even try to leave the U.S. So that is something that you don't have with, say, Bitcoins. That's they can declare it illegal, but uh, that won't affect the value necessarily. So if we watch somebody put a whole lot of money into negative bond rates, that's indicative of something, isn't it? If, if someone's actually going to lose a percent, they're not that crazy. They're seeing something that maybe we should step back and view a big picture. Yes, it depends who does it. You see, in Europe, insurance companies, they have to buy bonds. They can't have everything in equities or in precious metals by law. Uh, they have to buy bonds, and then they buy bonds according to, say, uh, the MSCI bond index. So they have to buy Japanese bonds, they have to buy Swiss bonds, and they have to buy German bonds, and so forth. 
But there are also private people that buy these bonds. Mm -hmm. right. Not only institutions. Right. Or if you tell me, Mark, uh, what do you think about the U.S. bond market? Well, the yield is now 2.7% or whatnot, the 10 years. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's attractive, you understand, to, to earn 2.7% for the next 10 years. Right. But there is one condition under which it would be very attractive. If the price level goes down, if your house drops 30%, if the per stock portfolio drops 30% and so forth and so on. And I would not rule that out entirely. You understand? So maybe the bond market is not so totally stupid to be at where it is now. Now, question about silver and gold. Yes, I agree that they are relatively low. And as I said, I own gold. But if everything drops 30% uh, in value, like stocks, and uh, even bonds drop somewhat, could happen, and the yield goes even higher, and art drops, and real estate drops, and you know, you have a general asset deflation, then gold and silver may not go up a lot. Uh, they may go up, but maybe not. Or if they go up, they may go up a little, but it's much better to go up a little than to lose 30% on your stocks. Most definitely. So this is my view about gold. I think uh, every investor should hold some, but I don't think that the investor should put all their money into gold. That wouldn't be my view. So as always, I say you have to be diversified because you don't know exactly whether you're going to get hit from the right with money printing and low taxes for the very wealthy and high taxes for the working people like you and me. <laughs> <laughs> or you're going to get hit by the left who will tend to or want to take things away from you anyway. You know, you brought up something very interesting, interesting and it's a really good point about OAC, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. And I think it's something that people don't look at. You know, everybody steps back and sort of laughs at her right now. Um, all of the alternative media, it seems like the politicians, you know. But the truth is, she represents the reality of what the Republican and the Republicans, let's face it, and all of these QE um, processes have created. They've created a situation where we have um, a lot of um, very poor people that are struggling so and don't see, Correct. don't understand the impact of socialism. All they see is the fact that all these people have a lot of money and why can't they spread it out? And so it's a very dangerous thing we've, we have yes. created her, basically, and she's... Uh, the, <laughs> Mayor de Blasio said, there's plenty of money in New York, but it's in the wrong hands. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, but actually, to be fair, and I think that one has to be, you know, a little bit informed about all these people. Some people hate Trump. And some people, they laugh about uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. But actually, I listened to some of her speeches. In some instances, she makes horrible gaffes and says things that are really stupid. But equally, uh, as you say, she represents not a political party, but a movement of people that are truly struggling. They have not a penny left at the end of the month, not one. In fact, they have to go into debts. If one of their children is sick and so forth, that wipes out the whole family budget. You understand? Mm. So a lot of people actually struggle, and I also see this in many emerging economies and so forth. And I think uh, the system should be a free market economy and a cap capitalistic system. But I also think there should be some social justice. 
Yes. And she is an extreme with which I disagree. And Trump is another extreme with which I kind of also disagree. You understand? <laughs> so I think we should find a kind of a middle way where we have free markets, but where the contributions, especially of corporations, the corporations at the present time, they pay very low taxes. Mm. You know, as I stated, uh, corporate tax rate and the effective, the effective is very low. The real one. <laughs> yes. So I think the corporate sector should probably pay more tax. And I think this money printing caused this enormous wealth inequality. And I'm not saying this because of any grudge. I, Mark Faber, confess that I benefited enormously from money printing. <laughs> and from that point of view, in a way, I think if they continue to print money and asset prices go up and stocks recover and this and that, it benefits me. But as an economist and as a social observer, it doesn't make me happy because I know that sooner or later, the uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of this world will come and go after the rich people. In a and in the way. Russian Revolution, yes. they chopped off their throats. And the French Revolution, they put them under the guillotine or hanged them. You understand? It can get very ugly. And so forth. And uh, so I think it's better to try to rectify some of the uh, ills that we have today in this crony capitalistic system before it gets out of hand. Exactly. Because history shows what happens when you have a massive amount of very it poor people. Get, it can get unpleasant. Yes, yes it could. <laughs> now, Mark, before we go, and I think we all would like to hear your predictions on 2020. Do you believe that President Trump is a shoe in Well, I think he may well be re-elected. Because so far, I haven't seen a very convincing Democrat as a candidate. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people will say, well, we dislike this idiot. I'm just quoting here <laughs> Anne Coulter, who calls the, uh, says the only national emergency is we, the, our president is an idiot. <laughs> That's not necessarily my view. But you said... Uh, Ocasio-Cortez represents, you know, a group of people that really ha are struggling. Trump reflects a group of people that is ignorant. Ignorant about just anything. But talks big and acts big and has always big words and then the results are very small or non-existent. Mm. But I think a lot of people will vote for him for the simple reason that they're afraid of more left-leaning uh, Democrats. You're afraid of the socialist movement. Yes. As well they should be. <laughs> As well everyone is, actually. So I, I thought <laughs> Trump would win the last election, and I thought it would be good for the stock market. Uh, I think he will probably be re-elected unless he makes really a stupid mistake. Okay. And you don't foresee a huge mistake. What might that well, be? Well, uh, you know, everybody says the economy, you will not go into recession until 2020, 2021, and so forth. Who knows? Uh, maybe you'll wake up in three months and people uh, will admit that the recession started in November, December 2018, because the recent economic statistics haven't been very good, hmm. considering all the money that is being created yeah. through deficits and so forth, you know. 
it's insane the amount of money that's been created, but yet is nowhere to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, it's nowhere to be seen by ordinary people. Exactly. But but if you go to the areas where wealthy people live, you will see it. A lot of it is wasted, admittedly. Yes, Mark. It is always such an honor to have you on well, the show. Well, don't say that. Thank you for being on your program <laughs> and for your time. Oh. <laughs> now, please tell everyone how they can follow your work. Well, I have a website, gloomboomdoom.com, and uh, I publish two reports, a printed version, the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report, and then I have a website report called uh, the monthly report. So, <laughs> my work. And you're a be best selling followed. author, too, we want to mention. You have some outstanding work. I think one book, uh, Tomorrow's Gold Asia's Age of Discovery, which I uh, wrote in 2001, is obviously uh, somewhat outdated. But I still think that if I look at the world and the you know, it's amazing when you think of China. In 1970, it consumed 2% of all industrial commodities. In 1990, 5% of all the industrial commodities that were consumed in the world. And now over 50%. You know, it's something that has happened. This is not a dream. This is not a wish. This is the reality. And you, if you look at some of China's technology companies, they're extremely advanced, extremely advanced. It's not a question of stealing everything from any, everybody. They develop their own technologies. <laughs> the world has changed a lot. And I think the way I came to Asia when it was poor, it is now affluent. And uh, in 50 years, it will be enormously affluent in my view because here we don't have yet the social security programs that are exist in Europe and the US which may very well slow down economic growth you, know, you, you understand it depends how you spend your money in the US these budget deficits may very well have actually slowed down economic growth and Europe anyway where the government gets bigger and bigger as a percent of the economy, growth slows down. In Asia, governments are still small as a percent of the economy. So, yeah, well, we'll see. What impact <laughs> will that have on the United States? Well, if you look at the at history of mankind and of civilization, no country in the world was ever as advanced as Egypt uh, in the year 3000 BC relative to the rest of the world. You understand that they could build Karnak in Luxor and the pyramids when we Europeans were in caves and living on uh, the lakes in uh, uh, living centers uh, where huts were essentially built on top of the lakes. And we lived in caves. And I had no idea about the knowledge Egypt had. And then the Persian civilization came along and so forth and so on. And so I think that it's normal that the country becomes very, becomes very powerful and the superpower and uh, the gross economy of the world, like in the early 19th century Britain. And then it's displaced by someone new. There's nothing to be afraid of that. The issue is how do you age well? Some city states have aged well. Venice is still a city that does well. Salzburg in Austria is doing well but they're no longer what they used to be. Right. And uh, so we have to realize that these changes are taking place and it's better not to go to war for these changes or against these changes 
because war usually accelerates the relative decline. And it's so interesting. I mean, all we have to do is look at history. So when we're on top and we're doing well, try not to destroy ourselves or let our political leaders to do so because history repeats itself, right? Everybody yeah. goes, it all balances out. I don't think that the Chinese are really a threat. They never really invaded the country. They never had territorial expansion plans, except for one, Tibet. But you have to look at the geography of Tibet and all the rivers essentially come from Tibet. Those are the rivers that flow through India, through uh, the Indochina, the Mekong, which flows through first from Tibet to China, then to Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So all these rivers are very important for China because China lacks water. Mm. But aside from that, I mean, they never invaded another country uh, per se. And they don't like all these American military and naval bases in Asia. That's natural being such a large country. So anyway, it will be interesting to watch what uh, comes out of all these uh, different forces and different perspectives. Yes, it will. Thank you so much for coming on this show. You're welcome. Bye-bye, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Dr. Mark Faber, whose outstanding achievements and uncanny predictions are covered in our exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Faber. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. In March, we already released David Stockman, who was warning to get the hell out of the markets. His full warning is available at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash David. Charles Hugh Smith, who talks about the new America, rich and homeless, living side by side. Read it all at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Smith. And a no-holds-barred interview with Bob Moriarty. He really went hard on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. You can go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Bob for the details. We also plan on releasing one of the bombshell interviews of the year, conducted with David Stockman. In the month of February, we have released a worldwide scoop with G. Edward Griffin, the 87-year-old best-selling author who introduced the world to the banking cartel, and is published with us, the PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash G, Critical Federal Reserve Update. We also just released interviews with the man who exposes the deep state and the shenanigans of Washington better than anybody else, Robert David Steele. And I highly suggest going to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Robert. Of course, for the most accurate information on Mark Faber's latest and best, go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Mark. It's essential reading.